Okay, so welcome back. We're here to continue with lighting, lighting in X3D. So we're now going to start going over the lighting nodes and we'll begin with directional light. Okay, so directional light is the simplest and uh, uh, easiest uh, node, lighting node to understand. And what it does is, as a lighting model, it says all light rays are coming from a single direction, parallel rays, and so any surface that's presented in there, if it's a flat surface, every pixel being drawn on there will be receiving the same amount of light and will have the same angle, uh, the same incident angle to the light source before it goes back to be drawn. Okay, and uh, what else can we say about that? Well, uh, back faces don't get lit and everything gets lit by uh, ambient intensity, meaning the reflected light from uh, that's assumed to be within a scene. So I should say, uh, back faces are not lit by the direct factor of the light, which is the intensity factor times the color. Uh, the ambient intensity will always exist for everything. Okay, so how bright something is, uh, what color it appears to be will be highly impacted by what is the angle between the surface that's being lit, the light source, and the camera viewing it. So when it's coming down, uh, coming down from the light source to the surface and up to the eyes, then uh, this is this is what we get. Okay, so. If we ask, well, what good is a light source that seems to go all from one direction? That doesn't seem very realistic. It's actually quite realistic for outdoor sources. Uh, 93 million miles away, uh, those light rays are pretty close to parallel when they're, they're coming in uh, if you're modeling an outdoor scene. And for uh, certain indoor scenes as well, where there's a bank of lighting uh, at the top of the room where the, the lights themselves are not considered part of it, what we're uh, trying to draw, but rather the uniform, fairly uniform lighting within a room. Certainly when people design rooms, create buildings, the architects are trying to achieve that kind of uniform lighting throughout. So it's uh, not a bad uh, approximation at all. So here's a drawing illustrating that. Uh, as ever, the, uh, the light itself is not visible, but if this is the center of, uh, uh, actually we can't say uh, center, we can say uh, there is no center of the light because they're all parallel. And uh, try to indicate that in, in this uh, picture here, so you could draw arrows wherever you want and as long as they're all parallel that would indicate how far they are. If you're being precise and using the length of the arrow as the vector, they would also be consistent length. And the direction is uh, defined so you get to control that. And let's look now at the fields that make up this light. So we covered uh, several of the basic uh, common fields already. Here we see se several of them. Uh, ambient intensity, color, global, and intensity. And finally, on the Boolean, whether the light is turned on or off. Those are all implemented the same in this light as they were defined at the beginning. But we add one further field, and that's direction. And the direction field is the vector in not as an SF rotation but rather as an XYZ vector to uh, show which direction they're in. So this bears a little attention <coughs> to the fact that it's not an SF rotation. It is dependent on the parent transform coordinate hierarchy. Boy, that sounds like a mouthful, but it merely states that if you have a scene graph, 
with uh, multiple transform nodes, etc., before you finally get to your directional light, then <coughs> that is the orientation of the light. Any rotations that were in that parent chain would carry through to position that light right there. Why is that important? Well, because often we'll do use transformations to get things oriented in the proper direction. Perhaps the uh, original coordinates were not in the, the usual uh, XYZ coordinate frame for X3. So uh, this is quite possible that you would get this kind of chain here and then the direction would be the direction that steers relative to that. If you want to go, okay, well, I figured out S SF rotation, how do I figure out this part right here? Uh, let's see what's going on here. There we go. Uh, how would I figure that out? Well, it's, it remains quite simple. If uh, we're looking at the screen coordinates, X and Y, the Cartesian arrangement is how uh, this looks on the screen, and then Z comes out of the screen. So there's your XYZ direction. So it's simply a three tuple vector, uh, slightly simpler definition for our uh, light. Since we don't care about twist in there, this is why we don't have a full SF rotation. Okay. Now a few cautions, warnings, hints if you will. Uh, if you're pointing a directional light field in the wrong direction, it's pretty hard to figure out because the light node itself is not visible. As we saw on the previous slide, that uh, uh, sorry, this is uh, where's my doodah? -doo? Okay, we'll do it this way. So on the previous slide, that the uh, direction itself um, uh, is consistent for all of them, and it's also not visible. So as a result, it, you can't put your finger on it. It's not somewhere in the scene. It's just a vector field that is everywhere going in the same direction through that field. So trying to debug what direction is that pointed can be a little tricky. The way to do it is uh, you could put uh, some kind of vector, some kind of sign, some kind of symbol in your scene to help indicate that direction. Okay, uh, If you're having trouble just locating it, it, somehow your directional light got mistranslated or misrotated and you're trying to find out where is it in space, why can't I see it? Uh, is it possible that I'm lit but pointing in the wrong direction and that's why everything's black? then this would be the case where you, you might substitute a point light for it. And by putting that point light in, you might get a better sense of, oh, the light's over there and I've found it and now I can push it by a translation or a corrected rotation to be back where I want it. Okay? Uh, if you want to steer a light using an SF rotation, perhaps you want to drive it around using an orientation interpolator, uh, then you can put a parent transform in there. In fact, uh, Chris, this is probably a good example for us to put in the notes for this page. So uh, let's put a placeholder right now. And um, so the interesting pattern for animation would be, uh, well, heck, I won't even type it in. I'll, let's, just, let's just draw it here using X3D edit. We'll create a new scene. And we'll get our palette up on the screen. Anybody see a palette hiding here somewhere? There it is. Okay, and then 
in the scene, we'll put a we want to animate a directional light. So we'll put the directional light in and just leave that as is. We'll call it light source. And then we'll put in uh, a parent transform so we can move it around. So we'll stick that right there. Actually, let's check something here. We have a, uh, here's a nice feature. I don't know if you guys have used this before, but wrap parent element around the current element. So let's do that. Click wrapping parent around element. Say so yeah, give it a transform as its parent. Okay, that's good. We're not going <coughs> to die it. We just want to uh, we'll call it uh, our light transform. Okay, so far so good. We're still valid, and then we want to. Uh, steer this around, so that means we need a uh, time sensor clock and an orientation interpolator. So we'll go to the event utilities, excuse me, the uh, event animation, and we'll put in our time sensor. And we'll call this clock. Valid. And then we'll put in our orientation interpolator. And we'll give this uh, two values. So we'll start at, uh, at time zero. We'll have it be a regular uh, rotation value around the white y axis. And then We'll give it a second rotation value. Uh oh, that doesn't look good, does it? Well, let's say it looks like we might have a bug here. We'll accept it and take a look and see what happened. Okay, so we've got a problem. Bug report for our orientation interpolator. Let's start with a zero rotation and let's just rotate it. Uh, 90 degrees, which would be pi over 2, which is 1.57. Okay, and now all we need to do is add routes, correct? We've got a source, we've got an interpolator, we've got a target. So the first route will be from our clock. And we'll send that down to the orientation interpolator. Oops, I need a, a name for that. So. Let's accept it and get a name on there. Orientation interpolator. Our uh, def name for that guy will be spinner. Okay, now we can finish up this uh, route right here. And we're going to route from our clock to our spinner. And sure enough, uh, the tool picked the right fields uh, to hook up there. Fraction change goes to set fraction. Okay. Everything's valid and happy again. Let's add another route. And another route. And let's edit these guys now. Given that we have a spinner orientation interpolator, we want to send that to the transform. And what value? Our value change gives us a rotation. And so we have a mismatch type now, so we have to pick the right field. Aha, there it is, not in red rotation. So there we go, we're spinning it. And let's keep going. And then 
we have one more route to fill in. So I take that back. We don't have another route to fill in. Three nodes, two routes, we're all done. Let's check validation. It's clean. Okay, so there's our pattern right there. This is how we would use the animation of an SF rotation to spin a directional line around. And I'll stick that in the notes for this slide. Parent transforms. That's good right there. Okay. Simple enough. If you want to see the scene graph for that, we'll go back to X3D Edit and simply uh, expand this guy right here. And there it is. Let's even take a picture of that thing. Alt <coughs> Back to the slides. Paste. Boom, presto, instant picture. Okay, so hopefully you're doing the same thing in your travels through the text, through the book, through X3D here of, yeah, gee, I have an idea. What would that look like? Let's just build it. And there you go. Okay, so... I guess we should note that if there is an alternate way to animate this too, uh, and that would be with a position interpolator. So we could animate the directional light directly by using a position interpolator. Why is that? Because they're both SF Vec 3F data types for each one. Or we could stick with SF rotation documented and in the notes. And if I squeeze this down just a little bit. Invisible. Okay. So there we go. Now here's our example. Uh, this shows, again, using some visi visible indicators, what direction our light uh, is, is showing. And it also illustrates some uh, interesting parts about this. So we have the direction of the light is shown by this set of four arrows here, which is simply a cylinder and a cone put together. And then by inspecting each of these surfaces, we can see where is the light going and what's getting lit. And so I'll uh, uh, highlight the dark parts. See that's dark, 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 darker back here because it's hidden from the scene. If we uh, also look at the bright parts, well, you can see those cylinder bottoms, excuse me, the cone bottoms are getting exposed right there. And of course, the faces of these things as well. Another thing to see is not there is shadows. No shadows. The light is just going directly through the uh, geometry and passing uh, as if it wasn't there. The reason for that is we don't do collision detection of light rays. That would greatly slow down the rendering. 
advanced rendering, there are uh, uh, tools like Pavray and other uh, ray tracing oriented uh, programs and algorithms that will take into account this and will bounce light off multiple things. We don't do that. We simply shine the light at the polygons and bounce it off towards the viewer. It's a single reflection computation and that's why there are no shadows. Could they be added to X3D? Yes, that's a current area of discussion and research. It's also implemented several ways by several different groups, so it would appear at this point that we can add shadows. Uh, it's already a feature in some browsers, and the question now is can we add it consistently and put it in control of the author so that you might decide what things do I want shadowed, what things do I not want shadowed. Okay, and here's the zoom in on that uh, scene. I've uh, hidden a lot of the uh, nodes, compressed them, just to uh, show you the basic structure of where this works. And um, pretty self-evident. You can also see uh, in the editor for the directional light, here's how it works. Let's fiddle with this just a little bit. and. Uh, play with the scene. Okay. We'll redock our scene graph and we'll reopen our XJ3D window and we'll get back to the right scene here. fresh on the viewer and there it is and you can see that it's pretty hard to deduce the exact direction of the light if you don't have that visual indicator in there because a lot of things from behind are dark for a wide range of angles because they're just not being illuminated and it goes down to no illumination as you get perpendicular 90 degrees on but as we rotate this scene and I'll open it up a little bit to make that more evident. As we do rotate this scene, you can see the difference. Okay, so now let's fiddle with that. Uh, let's take our directional light and change the direction. And instead of pointing in the negative one Z direction, let's point in the positive one Z direction and see how this changes it. Now I won't change any of the other uh, uh, icons, so I won't move those uh, cylinder cone arrows around and we should expect to see it opposing the actual direction of the light. So I'm launching it externally in one of the other browsers right now and here we go. Uh, gee, it looks pretty dark, doesn't it? at least from this viewpoint, as we rotate the scene around and we get to the other side, we can see, oh, yeah, sure enough, uh, uh, the light is going towards these guys in the opposite direction of the cones. And the reason why the cones themselves are kind of dark, it might not be visible on the video, but as I get uh, close to it here, we can see that indeed since the, the color of the um, can you guys tell in the class here on that monitor, maybe that shows it there. Since they're dark gray to begin with, we can see that the cone top does have some lighting to it. It's a slightly lighter gray than the rest of it, but the rest, since it was gray to begin with, didn't have, need much loss of light to get dark. Okay, so there you go. That's how you would move a light around and get it to match the angle that you want. Okay, and I think that finishes us up with directional light. And we can see the tool tips now. And uh, no big surprises there. All looks good.
so what's our next node? Uh, well, uh, our next light that we want to look at is not a node by itself at all, but actually <coughs> a special field in a special node elsewhere that by default is on, and, and it, by default is the reason why we usually have light in a scene while we see it. And that, of course, is the headlight field in the navigation info node. Headlight field, navigation info node. Okay, and uh, it's a simple Boolean, on or off, which means it's very simple to utilize. And by default, it's turned on so that by default, when you drop in a scene, you will be able to see things no matter where you go because that light is slave to the camera and will follow the user's view, whatever they're looking at, so there is some direct illumination provided for whatever geometry might be ahead. Okay? And so uh, this is kept simple in order to uh, keep things uh, simple enough for uh, anybody to use uh, without even thinking about it. Okay? And as a result, we don't have a lot of switches on this. We don't have any switches, really, except for turning it on and off by a true or a false value in that balloon field headlight. Okay. Now, if you wanted to see what that would be if we were to define it ourselves, this is the directional light definition that matches what, it, what parameters it has. So the color is always white, the ambient intensity is always white, the uh, direction is always uh, 0, 0, negative 1, meaning the negative z-axis. And why is that? Because the default viewpoint is at 0, 0, 10, 10 meters out on the z-axis, looking towards the origin. So that means we want our headlight to be pointed towards the origin. And then the special thing about this guy, it's not just always pointing there, it's pointing there relative to the camera point of view. So it's also the perpendicular from the screen straight into the scene, and, and that's what we're saying here. It's always pointed out from the center of the active view. So you can't steer this thing. This is just the direction it's at. It's fixed to that orientation and will always follow you around, and the only choice you have is do I turn it on or do I turn it off using that headlight trick. Okay, so here's what the uh, interface looks like on Navigation Info. Uh, we saw that uh, back in the Viewing and Navigation chapter. And so it's a simple Boolean checkbox in the interface. And there you go, we're all done. Okay, so simple node. And we put it here in the notes because it is the same as a directional light. So that tells you everything you need to know about it. Okay, next node, next light, is a point light. Okay, and it's, uh, as the name implies, it's a point source, single point light source. Right there in the middle, and it shines equally in every direction. So if you consider the lighting equations and how this might be computed mathematically, you can see that just like a directional light, all the light vectors being constant in the same direction is pretty simple to calculate in terms of vector arithmetic. Trigonometric calculations of where it is. This is similarly simple. It's not computationally very complex to go, okay, whatever surface I want to illuminate, Somewhere, that point light, I can compute the direction of where it is. It's a very simple formula, find the perpendicular from a point to a plane. So, computationally, this is not burdensome, and that's why it's an easy note to use and fast to implement. Um, the mental analogy you might want to have is that it's a single uh, light bulb, a small, meaning a point source uh, that shines everywhere, as opposed to uh, some lights, which are big flat panels, almost planar when you get a bank. Okay, um, 
what else can we say about this? Well, like the diagram is trying to indicate as the yellow gets more and more faded, moving away, the farther you get, the less intensity there is, just like with the regular light. And so um, uh, that's how the uh, strength of the light will, will change as you get farther and farther away. The rotation doesn't matter. You could put any kind of uh, transformation node hierarchy on top of this thing. Could be anywhere in the scene graph. Could have a dozen transform nodes that are rotating and translating. And if you think about that, well, uh, the rotations and translations will matter about what final position is in, but they won't matter whether the light is spun around because its intensity is equal in every direction. It's an omnidirectional light. Uh, so we might cast that simply as the rotation of the light is irrelevant. The rotations in those transforms will matter because depending on the translation rotation, that determines where does it finally end up. Okay, other similar things. Uh, we can't see that point in space itself. There's no drawing there. Further, uh, uh, there's no shadows and no blocking by geometry. Okay, fields, uh, mostly the same has the same basic fields in common with the others. And then the attenuation factor is how we keep track of how fast is the light, the light dropping off. And it can be up to a quadratic expense. So this is where you could put a special effect if you wanted more rapid or more gradual fading of the light. You get to control those coefficients. I uh, would want to point out to your attention though that uh, as you get to quadratic, the computations for that get more and more expensive at runtime. So you might find if you're using a lot of fancy quadratic lights for special effects, that your runtime performance is reduced. Uh, hopefully not. Graphics cards keep getting better and better, but it's something to be cognizant of. Okay. Uh, what else do we have? The location uh, is a simple uh, SFX3F, meaning XYZ value. Of where did I put that light? It is subject to the coordinate transformation hierarchy, all those parent transform nodes. And then the radius is uh, very helpful too because it lets us put an absolute scope on how far the light can shine. So that's good if you're, uh, if you want to say have a point light in the middle of the room and you don't want it bleeding off uh, into other rooms or at least not very far into other rooms. Point light in the center at the top of the room would work pretty well if you make the radius greater than where your four corners are, then the only effects for that light would be into the other sides of that wall. So it wouldn't illuminate the other sides of the walls because it's behind them. And so if something got very, very close to the wall, you might see it lit from behind, lit from the other room. And uh, well, I guess you could make thicker, thicker walls if you want. Or Something. The judicious use of these things can make it uh, pretty effective. Okay, now uh, because each point on an object is not at the same distance from the point light, you may see some brightness variations. That won't look like much if you just say, how far is my ball from my light? But uh, Given the combination of distance and angle, you will definitely see shading effects across this thing. And if you use uh, a very big polygon, meaning a single polygon, you probably won't notice it at all because that whole polygon gets shaded. So uh, the lesson learned there is if you want that kind of precise drop off in light, then you need to have more than a single polygon there that gets lit. And we'll see some uh, examples of that. You, you might need to use a special tool to tessellate, to subdivide into sub-polygons, a big polygon to get an accurate shape. Uh, 
normally we don't have to worry about that. Just getting your viewpoints and your lights in the right place will, will do a good job. Okay, so let's look at an example of what happens when you use just a single polygon or you use lots and lots of polygons. So on the left hand side we have lots and lots of polygons. On the right hand side we have an example of two polygons. Okay, Now it's both a square face. If there were no point light at all these would look absolutely identical if you're just using a directional light because with directional light all the rays are in parallel. But with point light we do get this variation reflecting back to that single point. So if on the uh, topmost we only have a single, uh, if we have two polygons right here, they're each going to get lit individually and so we see very little variation. But when we have hundreds of triangles on the left hand side, each little triangle is getting its own contribution of light computed individually and that's why we see a nice smooth bright spot out to uh, darker on the outside. So let's take a look at this in the tool itself. Okay, so here's our example. If I rotate this around, you can see as we go edge on there, Wow, that's a pretty bright light on the left, but it's certainly a flat polygon. Flat set of polygons. If I shift into wireframe mode, we can see the colored lines there and still make out on the left how that looks when it's fully shaded. Now, where are these lights themselves? We didn't draw those in the scene, but let's check it out. Let's look in here and we see, okay, we have a faceted box and then we have a simple box. Simple box is actually a box node. The faceted box is an index face set with lots of coordinates. So we intentionally tessellated, triangulated this quadrilateral into many sub polygons here. Uh, how many? Well, we can look at the index and sort of guess 40, 60, 75, 95, 120, 185, 230, 400, and 440-something triangle, or at least 440 vertices, so several hundred triangles. So uh, we wrote a little program, no doubt, that did that, and I think Leonard did that. In fact, could you please uh, put in the notes for today? Why don't we ask Len, how did he how did he tessellate that? That might be an interesting footnote to this example. Okay, uh, now given that we have a highly faceted box and a simple two-part box, then and each one's fairly flat, right? It's a 20 by 20 meters with uh, only 0.1 meter depth. Then let's look at our point lights. Here's our first point light. Its location is 006 to get it off to the center and it's also transformed. It's inside the transform where the other box is. So that light's right next to it, six meters away. What does the other guy look like? Well, here we go. The other, the other highly faceted box is 15 meters to the left and then our point light is within six meters of the center of that. Okay. So if we go back to our picture, what's left on this guy is if those are 20 meters by 20 meters, then if we go flat here, and uh, I'll zoom out just a little bit, we say that's 20 meters right there from there to there, then 
our light is going to be 6 meters. In each case, well, that, that one was off a little bit, but how's that? Close enough for government work. Okay, so uh, there you go. If you want to play around with this example, a good uh, activity would be to draw the lights in and put a little sphere there, or perhaps even more subtly, a pixel using a point set. Still hard to see, but at least you'd have a placeholder in place. You might experiment with, <coughs> is that good enough, and is that a helpful offering tool? Okay, so what's left? I think we've got it. We're all set with point light now. So we've seen the three major ways to do lights. That's point light. Excuse me. First we, set, we looked at directional light, and then we looked at uh, the navigation info headlight, which is a, a special type of directional light, and then finally we did point light. Where are we going next? We'll finish tomorrow with uh, the spotlight node, which is uh, the most sophisticated of them, uh, has a little more uh, controllability, but we'll see that it's very consistently designed with the other lights and uh, gives us a nice final addition to our repertoire of how do I light a seat. Okay, see you then.